thank you for joining us this evening. Um, I think we have a few more people that are going to be joining, but we are going to get started because we have a lot to cover this evening. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, my name is Crystal Jacob, and I am a supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital uh, Women's Society. And for those of you who don't know about the society, the Women's Society is a group of women in all ages and stages of life, passionate about and committed to raising excellence in women's healthcare and treatment. The Women's Society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives at the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. And we host our Mind and Body Talks monthly as an inclusive speaking series to engage and stay connected with the community. Um, so before we dive into tonight's session, I am going to um, just cover some housekeeping things. Um, so tonight we have Rim Lawrence with us to explore what it means to be transgender, non-binary, cisgendered, gender diverse, and much more. Um, so for tonight's presentation, Rin is going to be using um, Jamboard. Um, so this will help you follow along in the lecture. Um, we have posted a link to Jamboard in our chat. So if you guys can't open it, just let us know and we can hopefully help you out with that. Um, at the end of the session, we will definitely have a question and answer period. And we ask that you keep your mics muted, um, ask the questions in the chat box, and then we will have our moderator um, address those. And um, lastly, there's two settings in Zoom. So you have your gallery setting and your speaker view. And for tonight, we would recommend that you guys use the speaker view setting. Um, so that's it for housekeeping. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to send all of our thanks to Alberta Blue Cross. So they continuously support these series for the Lois Hole Women's Society. Um, and Rebecca is going to bring greetings for us. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. We are so excited to uh, be able to be here for the for another um, health mind and body talk series it's so incredibly important and um and you know yesterday i was i was speaking with a friend about really what it means to be inclusive when we were talking about this discussion that's going to happen today and we talked about a bunch of different scenarios and what it comes down to is we thought is really a willingness and maybe an eagerness to learn and always do better and participating in discussions like this one we're going to have today this evening is a part of that journey and now putting after tonight putting those learnings into practice that's the other part of the journey I can say that we at Alberta Blue Cross are at the very beginning of our equity diversity and inclusion journey and I can say that openly because we recognize it and by being open about that we're, we're hoping to continue to make incredible progress I want to acknowledge that there is also an incredible amount of emotional labor that goes into doing the important work that Rin is doing and so I really want to thank you Rin for sharing both your lived experience and your expertise with us. All right, should we dive in? Thank you, everyone. Awesome, thanks, Rebecca. Um, so now I want to introduce tonight's speaker. We are so excited. Um, we have Rin Lawrence, who is a teacher with the Edmonton Public Schools. Rin has been teaching since 2013 being a part of two Alberta school districts and has partaken in school community GSAs and QSAs since beginning their teaching career. Rin is the chair of the Edmonton Public Schools Local 37 Diversity, Equity and Human Rights Committee and the Edmonton Public Teachers Local 37 Queer Straight Alliance. Rin's lived experience and dedication to inclusion fuels their passion when speaking to the importance of sexual and gender diversity inclusion. So welcome, Rin. Thank you so much, everyone, for having me. I'm very excited to be here and um, happy to do these talks. It's one of the most important things I do, and I love doing it. So thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you for the introduction, Crystal. As, as was said, my name is Rin and I use he, him pronouns and I'm happy to take you on this journey today. 
The first thing I'd like to do is a land acknowledgement. The Edmonton Public Teachers Local 37 acknowledges Treaty 6 territory, the ancestral and traditional territory of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Soto, Nakota Sioux, as well as the Métis. We acknowledge the many First Nations, Métis and Inuit, whose footsteps have marked these lands for generations. We're grateful for the traditional knowledge keepers and elders who are still with us today and those who have gone before us. We recognize the land as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on or are visiting. The second thing I'd like to do is recognize that this is a safe space. This can take many, many forms. The example I have on the screen is a simple statement that says this space welcomes all people regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. When we recognize a safe space like this, um, we are visually representing the inclusion that is present in that space, whether that space is physical or digital, as so many of us are becoming accustomed to with Zoom and um, meeting digitally. I have a little bit of an outline there. So I'm gonna go through some of the larger points. And um, then as was said, we're gonna have some time for questions afterward. What I wanna say about questions is that many people are worried about being offensive when asking questions in this area uh, or on this topic. I am here today to tell you that I will not be offended. Please ask me your questions. I am hoping to answer all of them. The presentation is set up um, under the flow of the questions that I most regularly receive. And so I'm hoping to answer most of your questions throughout the presentation. But if there's something that I don't get to, please feel free um, to ask it. And my email is provided as well in case uh, we don't make it to your question or run out of time. So the first thing I'm gonna discuss is assumptions. We as human beings assume a lot of things. Oh, that was the other thing I forgot to say at the beginning is uh, because I can't see your faces, I'm just going to assume you're all laughing at my jokes, okay? So laugh at the jokes, I'm assuming that you are. So we as human beings assume a lot of things. Wayne Gretzky is an amazing hockey player and therefore he had to be a good coach. That was an assumption that didn't work out so well for us. We assume that people that are tall are good at basketball. Well, I am five foot 11 and have the hand-eye coordination of a door. I am not good at basketball. That's an assumption that did not work out. We assume that all women wanna wear a dress on their wedding day. We assume that if you have short hair, wear a suit and no makeup, you consider yourself a man. We assume the gender of others, usually without realizing it. We make these assumptions based on facial structure, bone structure or body shape, vocal patterns, and often names, first names, given names. So today we're gonna to try to answer these two questions. How can we become more aware of our assumptions and how can we begin to change our assumptions to be more welcoming and inclusive? And the best part is I can answer both of those questions and sum the whole presentation up in one sentence. We need to talk about it. This is why we're here today and this is why you have chosen to come here today and that's fantastic. The more we talk about gender and gender diversity and sexual diversity, the more comfortable we will become with the terminology and the concepts and the less we will assume. So, um, oh, that should have, oh, I have to pop them all up. This is our first Jamboard slide, folks. So um, there's a link that was posted in the chat. It's also in the presentation. So at this time, I want you to try to get that Jamboard open um, and we're gonna talk about what is gender. Now, gender is something in our society that is uh, many ideas that's often conflated together. And this is not true. So we are going to try to break this up and we're gonna talk about gender in its parts. There's four parts there. If you go to your Jamboard, you should see it's like this, okay? And I'm hoping you all can see my mouse. I can see people are joining, so that's a good thing. Um, and if you watch my screen, over on the left-hand side of your screen, there's a button that says sticky note. It looks like a little square um, with uh, little writing pieces on it. You should be able to click on that and you have a sticky note screen where you can type. You can change the color or anything you want. Um, and what I'd like you all to do is give me your definition um, of those four things. So if I was going to write a definition for one of them, I'm going to say Rin's definition. 
and you click save and it'll pop up there. You can type another one, but if you hit cancel, then you can move it around uh, and put it with the, the um, term that you're wanting to answer. And then you can click on that sticky note and make another one to put on the others. So I'm gonna invite you to do that now. Go ahead and um, click on that sticky note. Oh, somebody's going already, that's perfect. And give me some definitions that you think um, apply to those four terms. So make sure you grab your sticky note and move it because they're all stacking on top of each other there. I can see, there we go. We got people moving them around now. Awesome. If you don't like what you typed or, or you had a, a mishap, you can just click on your sticky note and click delete on your keyboard and it'll go away. These are awesome answers, folks. I'm very excited by this. This is great. I'm going to give you about one more minute here, and then I'm going to go through some of these. Based on culture, I love that one. Okay, some of the sticky notes are slowing down. So I am going to continue to talk. You can keep the Jamboard open. We're going to use it again uh, a few times. So please uh, don't close it, hold on to it. I'm loving these answers. So on that gender one, on the left-hand side, we've got things like socially constructed gender identity, male and female, how we feel about our gender. Um, up at the top there, at the sex assigned at birth, we have, um, external genitalia, genetic makeup, biological sex based on reproductive organs. These are great answers. Birth certificate, parent identification, very good. Um, on the side, that gender expression, what we feel, how we want the, what we want the world to see, how someone chooses to dress and express themselves, very good answers. You're all experts already, I don't have to be here. Um, at the bottom, that gender roles based on culture, um, limited constructs of society, who you were born as. Okay, great. So I am going to flip back to the presentation, folks, and I'm hoping this transition goes smoothly, and I'm hoping that one of my hosts will tell me if it didn't go smoothly. So I'm hoping we all see the presentation again there, um, and I am going to go through these and break these down. So our gender is our own internal knowledge and understanding of yourself. This is an internal relationship that you have with yourself, okay? Gender expression, as many of you said on the Jamboard, is how a person presents their gender on the outside of their body or chooses not to present their gender on the outside of their body. This is things like clothing, hairstyles, sometimes mannerisms or behavior choices, and sometimes things like vocal patterns, depending on how much control we have over that. Sex assigned at birth is a legal designation that's given to an infant by a medical professional at the time of their birth based on their external genitalia. So when a baby is born, a medical professional looks at the external genitalia and assigns a letter, usually M or F, for that infant's birth certificate. This legal designation will then follow them for the rest of their life um, through all of their legal documentation, healthcare, driver's license, passports, etc. Gender typing or gender roles is a cultural or societal expectation of behavior based on your perceived gender. So the way other people perceive your gender and what they expect of you based on that. This is often where most of the problems arise for gender diverse people. 
This is a graphic that represents exactly what we just did on the Jamboard and what I just said on the last slide. So at the top there, we have gender identity. This is your own internal understanding of yourself. Gender expression, what we put on the outside of our bodies to choose to express that gender or choose not to express that gender. Biological sex there is an outdated term that we are trying to get away from using. But at the time that this term was used was referenced to a person's physical body. And sexual orientation is down at the bottom there. What's important here is to recognize that gender and sexual orientation are not the same thing and they are not related. Lots of people conflate them together. However, gender identity is your own internal understanding and relationship with yourself. This is an internal relationship. Sexual orientation is an, a relationship with another human being. That is an external relationship that you're having with another person. This graphic is a much more inclusive graphic and is one of the ones that we are wanting to use more than the last graphic. It's more updated um, and the biggest thing is that it was created from within the community. The previous graphic was not. So this was created by the Trans Education Student Resource um, and it is a very similar representation except we have multiple um, linear representations there. We still have gender identity, our understanding of ourself, gender expression, what we put on the outside of our body, Sex assigned at birth, here's our updated term that refers to your legal designation on your paperwork based on your genitalia at the time of birth. And then at the bottom there, we actually have sexual orientation split into two categories. So we have physical attraction and emotional attraction. So this is recognizing that you can have a physical or sexual relationship with another human being without having an emotional or romantic relationship with that person and also recognizing that we could have an emotional or romantic relationship or attraction to a person without having a physical or sexual relationship with that same person. Now I show both of these graphics to my students. Um, as Crystal said, I am a teacher and I work with kids. Um, and so I show both of these graphics to my students and they were unhappy with both of them because both of them have linear representations of these fields. My students created these circles um, in which they felt were much more encompassing because instead of having to pick a spot on a line, they could draw these weird oblongy shapes inside that circle and show that we can be in multiple places at once. We do not necessarily have to be stuck on one spot on a continuum. We can be in multiple places. Okay, terminology is another thing I'd like to go through. I'm not going to go through every single one up there on that screen. Um, I could probably do an entire hour just on terminology, so I'm going to keep it to a minimum. Um, on this screen, I want to address the first one. So cisgender is a term that is relatively new that we are trying to disseminate out into the world and get people to use. Cisgender means that you as a person your gender identity, your understanding of yourself, your physical body, and your sex assigned at birth, your paperwork, all match. This is the majority of society and usually is male and female, okay? We get a lot of questions about the word cis. What is it and where does it come from? It is Latin, so we use the word trans for transgender people. Trans in Latin means to cross. Cis means to remain, so this is that denotation of everything matching and remaining where we are. Now, the question I get at this point is always, Rin, why is there so many terms? I'm trying so hard and I learn one or two and then there's five more the next day. Why is there so many I can't even remotely keep up? So I have a bit of a metaphor for you to answer this question. So I put these two uh, colors up on the screen and I would say to you, what are these two colors? And lots of you would look at me and go, red and blue. And I would say, you're absolutely right. We have red and we have blue. So what we have done is created two categories, red and blue, okay? Two categories, male and female, right? Now, what happens when this color shows up? This color says, well, I'm not red and I'm not blue. I'm neither of those things. So what am I? We as human beings, what do we do? We make a label. And we say, okay, you're not red, you're not blue, you are purple. Great. And then what happens when these two colors show up? Well, we've made a whole other category. We have three categories, red, blue, and purple. But now we have two more colors that don't fit into either of those categories. 
So what do we do? We back down, we say, I don't know. I don't want to keep naming things. You name yourself. What do you want to be? And the first one says, I want to be pink. And the second one says, I want to be eggplant. Okay. And we end up with five categories. Okay. So you can see where I'm going with this, right? This is our color wheel and color spectrum. Can we, or could we ever make a name or a label for every color in that wheel? No, absolutely not. We couldn't, but we try because we as human beings like to label things. We like to put things into categories and boxes. But if we have something that does not fit into one of those categories and boxes, we need to create a new one in order for that person or that color to have a designation. Now, the other thing I wanna say here is that human beings are infinite in diversity, not only in gender and sexual orientation, but in things like languages and height and race and abilities. So this applies to all areas of human understanding. The last thing I wanna say about labels is that labels often get a bad rep. People say labels are bad, labels are bad. No, labels are only bad when they are put on us. So if I picked somebody out of this Zoom call and I said, you are going to be a plumber. And I picked the next person and I said, you, you are going to be a CEO. And then I picked the next person and I say, you, you get to choose. You get to be whatever you want to be. Right away, you're going to have some discontent develop. And one of you is probably going to tell me where to go, right? Because that label has been instilled on you. What labels do do for us is they allow for us to uh, explore who we are and try things on. And it allows us to find other people like us. And that is a positive thing. I'm going to go through some of the um, more notable gender diverse designations. The first one here that I'd like to touch on is intersex. Intersex people um, are very rarely talked about and they're one of the most influential in the gender diverse community. Intersex people are born with variations in their genitalia, chromosomes, or hormones that do not fit the traditional medical understandings of male and female. Okay, so this can be people who have two sets or both sets of genitalia. They um, maybe have absent genitalia or a combination. People who have chromosome variations, so XXY or just X, okay, or home hormone levels that do not necessarily match the traditional um, understandings. What's important to know is that there's more than 40 types of intersex variations. So that takes our gender count to 42, a lot higher than two, okay? And it's as common as being redheaded. So in a Zoom call of, I don't know how many people are here, um, but if I say we're in a Zoom call of 50 people, it is very, very likely that we have one or two intersex people here with us today. But being intersex is something that is underneath our clothes and inside our bodies, and it's not something we can see. So they often go unnoticed, um, and but, but experience many of the same barriers that other gender diverse people face. Transgender, you've probably heard, this is the one that makes the media the most. So a transgender person is someone whose gender identity, their understanding of themselves, their physical body, and their sex assigned at birth, their paperwork, do not match. Typically, this is trans male and trans female, meaning someone who has transitioned to being male or transitioned to being female. Okay, what's important to know about transgender people is that they may or may not choose to undergo transition. Now there's two types of transition. There's social transition and there's medical transition. Social transition is things like changing names, pronouns, gender markers on the legal paperwork or simply socially and verbally. Medical transition is having medical intervention that can be hormone um, treatment and or surgery. What's very important here is to know that transgender people are valid in their identity regardless of how much transition, social or medical, they have undergone. If someone says, I am a transgender woman and they have done no medical or no social transition, they are a woman and that is their identity, okay? It's also important to note that medical intervention for transgender people is very difficult to access. Here in Canada, there's only two cities that perform these surgeries, top and bottom surgery, that would be chest and genitalia surgery, um, is done in Vancouver and Montreal. Alberta Healthcare does cover the cost of the surgery. However, the external costs, travel and remaining in those cities during recovery, residence 
and food and all those things is not covered and uh, can be an extreme barrier for lots of transgender people. Further, in the process of accessing that at all, the first step is seeing a psychiatrist who deals with gender diversity and the waiting list here in Edmonton is approximately 26 months, more than two years. So this is a huge barrier for people. Gender non-binary, gender fluid, and gender queer. I put these all on a slide together, not because they're the same thing, but because they are related. So gender fluid person is someone who transitions between genders from day to day, moment to moment, minute to minute. Okay, so they do not identify with one single color box. They move between the colors. Okay, many gender fluid people experience additional um, social challenges if they choose to express that change in their gender on the outside of their body. So if someone shows up to work in a sundress one day and a suit the next day, they may have some social discontent from their colleagues, friends, family, etc. Gender non-binary is a more umbrella term, which simply means that you don't identify as male or female. You're not red and you're not blue, but you're not gonna give yourself another color designation, okay? Gender queer or gender diverse is the biggest umbrella term and simply means that you are not cisgendered, okay? Now I wanna address the word queer. For many years, this was a controversial and derogatory term and many adults, especially adults older than myself, are very uncomfortable with this word. If this is not a word that you are comfortable using, gender diverse is perfectly fine and perfectly acceptable and just as correct. However, it's important to know that the youth enjoy this word and have taken it back and many of them find it very affirming and choose to use it for themselves and that's fantastic. They get to pick their label. Two-spirited people um, are have a very unique experience and are very important to this community. So a two-spirited person is somebody who is both Indigenous and LGBTQ, okay? Now, again, we really must say Indigenous ways of knowing are much more holistic than our own. And so someone who is two-spirited might not actually be gender diverse. They might consider themselves uh, sexually diverse. Either way, if they are on that LGBT spectrum and are Indigenous, they're two-spirited. Prior to colonization, two-spirited people were revered leaders and mediators. Every time I have done um, professional development on two-spirited, the word divine is used because it was believed that they could truly understand both sides or both perspectives of any argument, conflict, or even just ideas and concepts. We have documentation of over 144 bands that had two-spirited people have, pardon me, um, had previous to colonization was the what came out of my mouth there. Um, and we know that they had words for them. So both the Cree and Blackfoot languages had seven gender designations and words for each of those seven. During colonization, two-spirited people did not fit into the European binary of residential schools and they were actively hunted down and killed. What began from that is the bands began hiding their two-spirited members in order to protect them and a shame developed around this. Now we are doing a large amount of active revitalization um, to re-instill pride and to learn from these individuals because they have a lot to bring to the table and a lot to teach us. And this is why it's very important to do a land acknowledgement when we are acknowledging safe spaces to make sure that our two-spirited brethren are included in that space. So this was the original slide I had up of terminology. As I said, I wasn't going to go through all of them. If there's one up there that you've never seen before and you'd really like me to go through, please hold on till to the end and I absolutely will. What I need you to know is that it's not essential for you to understand every term and there will always be new ones. I still hear new ones from my students. What is important is asking what we can do for that person uh, in order to support them. So I have six general um, questions that don't really fit anywhere else in the presentation. So I'm just gonna answer them kind of one after um, the other here. So the first one is, are gender diverse children, people gay, lesbian, bisexual, or other sexual minorities? So this question comes under the assumption with the conflation of gender identity and sexual orientation. Remember, we do not wanna put those together. So someone could be gender diverse, considering themselves gender fluid, for example, and also consider themselves bisexual or pansexual or asexual. 
However, we could have a transgender man who is married to a woman who may consider themselves heterosexual. So that's something we want to remember, not to conflate those two ideas. Do children or people choose to be gender diverse? No, absolutely not. And I'm going to go through this in uh, more detail throughout the presentation. This kind of comes in pieces. But to answer that question blatantly and outright, no, nobody chooses this. This is who we are and how we are born, how we are made, um, and we do not choose it, nor can we choose not to be it. How is it possible for a child to know that they're gender diverse so young? So we have statistics and research out of both the United States and Canada, the Canadian Pediatrics Association, um, identifying that children understand gender, gender identity, and gender roles as young as the age of four. To help you with this, I want, you to I want to encourage you to think about the gendered experience of a small child. As a baby and as a toddler, they're provided with clothing that is often very gendered. Um, there is a pink aisle and a blue aisle in the toy store. And very quickly, they begin to see that our society is set up on a red and a blue box. And if they do not fit in either of those two categories, they see that very quickly. It's also important to say that many gender diverse people um, don't know at a young age and will um, begin that understanding in themselves older, but we do have children identifying this as young as four years old. Um, the next one, I missed the word students. I thought I got all of them, <laughs> but I'm gonna say, I'm gonna go through this anyway. Um, I call this a pushback question. Nobody in this call tonight is asking this question because you are here to learn and you are here because you want to learn and you are here because you are trying to be inclusive. And I thank you for being here. So I wanna acknowledge that nobody in this call is asking this question, um, but I, I put it in the presentation so that if you hear this, you have the answer. So the question is, why should this matter to me if I don't have any gender diverse students? I had thought I caught all of these student um, words in my presentation, but we can apply this to anything. Why should this matter to me if I don't have any gender diverse colleagues or clients? The answer to that question is you do. You do have gender diverse colleagues, clients, students, youth, um, but if they do not feel safe enough to identify themselves because the assumption is they don't exist, then we don't know that they're there. Are children who people are cross-dressed gender diverse or transgender? This is another conflation of ideas. This question comes from giving clothing gender. So clothing does not have gender. Clothing just goes on the outside of our bodies. Um, so we are putting a gender on that piece of clothing by asking this question. Now, we can say maybe, so if we have a young boy who likes to wear dresses, could that child potentially being experiencing um, feelings of gender diversity? Yes, absolutely, it's more than possible. Um, however, he just might like the dress. I know many drag queens who look darn good in those heels and those dresses and consider themselves men. That is absolutely, totally fine. The last one here, how do I know where the line is when asking personal questions? The easy answer to this is if somebody asked you the question that you wanna ask about your own body or about your own relationship, would you be uncomfortable? And if the answer is yes, then it's too personal of a question to ask. Some of the big and heavy ones, that often come out um, are about bodies. Asking about somebody's body, their stage of transition or what's underneath their clothing is an offensive question and is not something that we ask. What's underneath your clothing is yours alone to know um, unless you choose to share that with a sexual partner. The other big one is asking about what we call dead names. So someone who has socially transitioned and changed their name, um, their previous name, their legal name, the name they were assigned at birth is often referred to as their dead name. Um, this is not a question that we ask. That person has separated themselves from that identity because it did not work for them. It did not feel right. So we leave that in the past and it's not something that we need to know. We're gonna validate who they are and who they're presenting as now. What does it mean to live a gender diverse life? Um, I'm gonna go through the first five there kind of on their own. But on this slide, I wanna talk about self-hate and self-esteem. Many gender diverse and sexually diverse people um, have struggle with self-esteem and develop self-hate. Now, this is um, not all, of course. However, it is something that many gender diverse and sexually diverse people deal with. The reason is because of our gender binary society, red and blue box, 
This is a recognition that I don't fit in either of these two boxes. And this is othering. Okay, so this is removing a person from a place of inclusion um, where they see that they are not represented. Okay, on top of that, if they are not supported by their friends or family or community, then they really do not have any sort of engagement in those places in society that they must attend work, school, the bus, etc. Okay, and it's important to say that um, a lack of support can also be from silence. So if we have someone who is supportive but is silent about it, that is viewed as a lack of support because it's not being put out there. Um, I have heard some gender diverse people talk about wishing to be normal. I hate that word and we're gonna come back to why a little later in the presentation. Um, but this is that idea that I can see these two boxes and I'm othered, but I cannot force myself to be in either of those two boxes. And if I try, this is extremely mentally taxing. So. Um, the impact of hiding has an extreme um, impact on mental health. So this comes from trying to hide who you are in everything you say to every person that you talk to, to everything that you express with your body, um, and becomes an overanalyzation of absolutely everything that you do. And in that way, this causes a lot of mental stress. Gender diverse people and sexually diverse people often feel excluded in their uh, community groups, family groups, and friend groups, and especially at work. I like to tell a story at this time. My brother is trans transgender and works in an office building in a cubicle type situation. And one year for the Christmas party, the staff decided to um, have a uh, Santa's anonymous draw. So everybody would pull a name out of the hat from somebody in the office. Whoever's name you got, you had to go to the store and buy a childhood toy that you thought that that person would like, wrap it, bring it to the Christmas party, and then one at a time, everybody would watch as you opened your gift, and then you'd have to guess who gave it to you, and then all the toys would go to Santa's Anonymous. Now, this is a great idea and wholesome and comes from a place of love. However, for my transgender brother, he has no control over who pulls his name out of the hat. And if that person incorrectly perceives his gender and buys a toy of the gender he does not identify with, he is then asked to sit while everyone he works with every single day watches, open that gift and be publicly misgendered to everyone in his office. And then he's forced to guess who did that to him. So he just chose not to go because it's easier. Okay, but this contributes to that exclusion um, and that removal and that otherness. Employment is also a big one. Interviewing is huge and a very large struggle for um, gender diverse people. I'll use a personal story for this one. Um, I, when I interviewed with the school board, I only had two options. I could either wear my shirt and tie and show up in what makes me feel confident, do really well in that interview and potentially not be hired because the person across the table from me is uncomfortable with transgender people or maybe has some suppressed transphobia or I wear what that person would perceive I should wear, hopefully do well through my discomfort, get hired, and then have to show up the first day on the job wearing that same thing because I have created a precedent of how I present myself, then wear the same thing the next day and the next day and the next day. And I've committed myself in that job to wearing something that I do not identify with in order to maintain that employment. The other one is that your perceived gender is stated at every term. I encourage you, if you're a cisgendered person here today, to try to watch for this because many cisgendered people don't notice it because it's correct. When you go to Walmart and walk in and the greeter says, hello, ladies, when you go to a restaurant and the server says, welcome, gents, what can I get you to drink? And forms are a huge one. And I encourage you <laughs> to look at this in your own workplaces. Do your forms have two boxes, M and F? I'm guessing that historically that's probably been the case. Unfortunately, that is a huge barrier for people like me and gender diverse people. I wanna throw it back to intersex people. They are medically neither, but they have to choose one because that's the way the form is set up. There's many other ways that we can represent that um, that is much more inclusive. The easiest one is putting gender and then a blank. And if your practice is medical and you need to know, have sex assigned at birth and gender. 
as separate questions. And then we can be inclusive of gender identity and still get the information that we need. Okay. What this does to gender diverse people is what I call forced disclosure or forced hiding. We only have two options. I have the option to correct the person that has incorrectly identified me and assumed my gender or my relationship and sexual orientation, or I can say nothing and pretend to be something that I'm not. I only have two options. Those are my only two um, ways to go. And what this often results in is coming out over and over and over again. Many cisgender and heterosexual people think that you come out once. You say, I'm gay or I'm trans, and you tell your friends and family, and it's over and done. But that's not the case. You come out over and over and over again with every new colleague you meet, with every um, person you interact with who assumes something wrong. You have to choose whether to come out to that person or pretend to be something that you're not and say nothing. Dysphoria is an important one to talk about. So Dysphoria is a great um, discomfort or unease that is resulted from um, the difference or, or discrepancy between your gender identity, understanding of yourself, and your physical body. Many gender diverse people experience dysphoria. It is not a requirement, okay, this is a big misconception that you have to experience dysphoria to be gender diverse. That is not the case. Um, only you get to decide your own label. Um, but this is often um, an adding to the internal self-esteem and self-hate and struggle and impact of hiding. This is a contributing factor because it's coming from within. And often we can see that in our peers and colleagues around us that they are not experiencing this. So this again adds to that othering, okay? The best metaphor I have for explaining dysphoria to cisgendered people is this. If you are a cisgendered man here today, I want you to think about what it would be like to truly have a menstrual cycle every month and how you would have to deal with that in your workplace, in the men's washroom, and how that would make you feel. If you are a cisgendered woman here today, I want you to imagine that you have to get up a little bit earlier every morning because you need to shave your beard that's coming in. And know that by four or five o'clock, you're probably gonna have to rush home because you need to shave again and how that would make you feel. That is my best metaphor for cisgendered people about gender dysphoria. Pronouns are a hot topic for gender diverse people. So she and he are the ones, those top two lines there that we are the most familiar with. They, them, theirs is gaining ground verbally um, in English language as a singular pronoun for gender diverse people. And this is because I mostly present to teachers. This is always where I have the English teacher stand up and say, um, no, I have, I have problems with this. So I wanna address that. First off, languages change and evolve. We have new things added to language all the time and we have things die off all the time as use changes. Secondly, we do already do this grammatically correctly in the English language. So if your spouse has a lump or back pain or whatever and goes to the doctor, your spouse comes home and you look at your spouse and say, what did they say? And right there, you have used a they, them pronoun in a singular way to describe somebody whose gender you did not know. And that is grammatically correct. We do that all the time, okay? Z, zer, zers, the bottom line there, um, is a singular pronoun that is not gained any ground verbally in the English language yet. However, um, it is gaining ground online in digital space in type format, okay? So we're going to go to our next Jamboard activity. I'm going to ask you to flip back over to that Jamboard that we had. And up at the top, I don't know, I think if I do it, it happens for everybody, but I'm going to show you just in case. There's little arrows here, and I'm going to click over onto the next one. And we have a new slide. You're going to make your sticky note the same way with that little sticky note button. Okay, and I want you to try to practice. This is something that people struggle with because it's not something that we do. So I want you to make a sticky note and I want you to tell me in a few sentences a story about um, the closest person to you, your spouse, your sibling, your cousin, your friend, um, but I want you to try to use they, them pronouns to tell me what their favorite color, activity, and movie is. Okay, go ahead. I want to see. I want to see you practice. Drop them up there.
I'm wondering if everybody is typing or if, oh, there we go. Make sure you to move them so they don't end up on top of each other, okay? Yep, perfect, thank you. Perfect. Anime, me too. Comedy, The Office, beautiful. These are fantastic folks, great job. I just noticed the clock and I'm feeling like I, um, I'm going slower than I thought I was. So um, I, am, I want you to keep going and put them all up there. If you still are, I am gonna jump back to the presentation and keep going. Okay, French uh, is also having some change around this area. EL and VUS, I do not speak any French, so I apologize if there's anyone here that does, and my pronunciation is awful. Um, however, French is having some changes as well. Uh, it is a gendered language, and therefore um, it has to be conjugated differently. And there is some movement on this. As I said, I don't speak French, but if this is something that you would like more information on, please get in touch, and I certainly can pass that along. Pronouns are, are a daily struggle for gender diverse people because this is often where uh, the perceived gender is stated. Um, chosen pronouns is what someone wishes to be called. So my chosen pronouns are he, him. This is not an offensive question, okay? So people are afraid to ask this question. You saying, hello, um, what are your pronouns? I just wanna make sure I'm calling you by the right thing is a very respectful question and I encourage you to do it, okay? Identifying your own is one of the easiest ways to do it. So when you meet somebody and you say, hi, my name is Rin, my pronouns are he, him, you invite that person to respond and tell you their pronouns. Name changes, again, chosen name is what somebody wishes to be called. We're trying to get away from that word preferred. This is not a preference, this is who I am. Um, but um, we want to treat this no differently than um, how we verbally treat nicknames or shortened names. If you uh, are in your work site, I encourage you to look at how you can have things changed in your computer systems, your demographic areas. This can be complicated, but it is absolutely worth it for gender diverse people. Um, my uh, workplace updated my name, regardless of the fact that it has not been changed legally. And this was one of the most validating and safe things that my business, my place of work could do for me. Do your best and forgive yourself. If you mess up, if you say a pronoun wrong, if you say the wrong name, that's okay. As long as you go back and you correct yourself out loud verbally, you are not only validating that person, but you are also um, practicing your own vocabulary and changing that one step at a time. Unsafe spaces are important to talk about. So bathrooms, change rooms, gyms, and classrooms that sort by gender are unsafe unsafe places for uh, people that are gender diverse. Language is another big one. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, mom and dad. This is the physical representation of the red and blue box, okay? Systemic organizations are also set up on the binary and often um, create these pieces of uncomfort for uh, gender diverse people because they do not fit in one of those two places. What's important here is to remember that the place itself is not what makes something unsafe. It is the people there. So people make a space safe or unsafe, okay? Um, I normally tell a couple stories. If maybe we have time at the end, I'll come back to that. But the best example is I work in an old, uh, old school building that only has binary bathrooms. And if every student and teacher in the building was totally fine with me using either bathroom, then it would be a safe space. However, that's not true. So it's not a safe space for me. Okay, I'm gonna talk about microaggressions really quick. I'm sorry I skipped a Jamboard, but I'm worried about going over time. The timer on my screen resets every time I leave the presentation, which is why I was not pacing myself well. So microaggressions are something that we often talk about uh, regarding uh, racism. However, it's absolutely true for gender and sexual diverse people as well. Verbally, this is things like hate speech or derogatory labels, the word normal, okay? Um, 
If something is normal, then anything that doesn't fit inside that box is abnormal. And this again is that othering, okay? Heteronormativity or gender normativity or the gender binary is that assumption that somebody's spouse is the other gender than them. But even there, that's an assumption that there is only two genders, mom and dad. Okay, so I work with students. And if we assume that a child has a mom and a dad, that might not actually be the case. Boyfriend, girlfriend, bring your wife to the party, etc. Oversexualization is a very damaging um, microaggression because it removes sexual and gender diverse role models from the youth's eyes when we say, oh, that person can't be involved in them because um, they, they are sexually crazy and, and, and it are a danger. This is very, very damaging and is completely untrue. The last one is that idea of wrongfulness, okay, or something being disgusting. This is a huge microaggression that contributes to what we were talking about earlier with those feelings of dysphoria, low self-esteem, self-hate, and can be a perfect storm when we add external forces agreeing with those things. Um, I have some statistics here. I want to check in with my friends though, um, because I can't see my clock um, about my time. Um, I'm wondering if I should skip forward. No, Rin, you have time, it's fine. Okay, okay, thank you, sorry. <laughs> um, okay, so, sorry? I just said this one, nope. Continue. Okay, thank you. Um, so why is this important? Um, I want you to know some things, and this is hard to hear, but it's important to hear. So 78% of trans students have reported some form of harassment related to their gender identity or gender expression. 35% of those students reported it being physical violence, and 12% have reported it as sexual violence. 96% of those youth have reported that that has occurred in a school or business setting, and 83% say that it is not limited to their peers, but also comes from staff. What's really important here too, folks, is to remember that this is not limited to youth. I know we hear stats about youth the most. However, 90% of trans adults have reported experiencing harassment on their job site, and 71 will attempt to avoid discrimination by hiding their gender or their transition from their superiors and their colleagues. And I was absolutely in this category. I needed a job and I needed to pay my mortgage and support my family. So I did this in order to be employed and be accepted in my workplace or what I thought would be accepted in my workplace. This is the hardest one to hear friends. So 70 or 47% of trans youth have thought about suicide and 28% of trans and two-spirited people will attempt suicide at least once in their life. So earlier we talked about self-esteem, we talked about self-hate, the impact of hiding, dysphoria, and then potential outside forces coming in on that as well. And in those instances, this is why this occurs. Typically what we're going to see of coping mechanisms um, out of those people are things like um, avoidance and invisibility, arriving late to work, leaving early, eating lunch by themselves, Okay, this is that exclusionary piece that's self-imposed, right? We're not feeling safe to be in community with others. Hypermasculinity or hyperfemininity. So this is trying to force ourselves into a box. Um, if I can force myself into that red box, then I can be included in that red box and I can hide. Vigilance and preparedness. This often comes out as like a constant monitoring. If I'm looking around for the danger, I can identify it beforehand and I can um, get out of that situation. Preparedness often comes out as aggression. Um, and there again, this is an idea that I have to defend myself. The best part about all of this is that we know that the risk comes from a lack of support, not from being gender or sexually diverse. So in that spirit, um, by being a person who is affirming and inclusive, you can change the experience for gender and sexually diverse people in your workplace. Support means absolutely everything. Again, lots of these studies are about youth um, because that's where the, the focus is. However, it absolutely applies to adults. So when we have chosen names being used in multiple settings, we saw less depressive symptoms, less suicide ideation and suicide behavior and positive mental health, higher self-esteem and a 93% reduction in suicide attempts. 
That is a staggering number and very important to note. And you can be that person by being that supportive ally in your workplace, being aware of your assumptions, you are literally saving lives. And I do not say that lightly, folks. I mean it exactly as I said it. You are literally saving lives by being inclusive. Most gender and um, sexually diverse people have to go to places where they do not feel safe, but you can be the person that creates that safe space. So the next question I always get then is how? Rin, tell me how. I'm in, I'm 100% in, I wanna be that person, tell me how. I can break this into three categories. Physical is the first one. Think about the physical space. Is there anything on the walls that supports heteronormativity or gender binary? And is there anything up that identifies that the space is safe? This can be something as big as a full-size rainbow flag, as small as a little poster, or as tiny as a tiny little pin. This is, I like to show this one off, um, that is worn on a lapel or on a shirt or whatever. Okay, something that identifies that this is a safe space and that that is upheld. Gender neutral washrooms are another one. Is there a gender neutral washroom space for gender diverse people? Verbal and social is the one that has the most impact. This is inclusive language, using phrases like friends or colleagues or parents um, in order to break that binary and not be reinforcing with things like mom and dad, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen. Being a visible ally and addressing homophobia and transphobia when they happen. I call this zero indifference. When it happens, you must address it. Go after it and do not let it hang because a lack of action is seen, that silence is seen as a lack of support. Strive for office-wide consistency. I know that's hard, um, but it starts with one person. It starts with one person making the choice to do this and it slowly grows and that's okay. Process. So no matter what your workplace is, no matter what you do, think about the process of your interaction with clients, staff, um, you know, colleagues, whatever, and try to find ways to make them more inclusive. Things like meetings, doing your intro, hi, does everybody know everybody in the room, and saying names, have that portion of the meeting include pronouns. Meeting in digital space, put your pronouns in your name. On my Zoom call, you can see that I have my, my name, Rin Lawrence, and I have my pronouns behind that. This identifies you as being a safe person who is aware of gender and sexual diversity. Um, I already talked about forms, <laughs> using partner one and partner two instead of wife, husband, right? That time, or spouse is a great one, gender and the blank. The other big one that you can do is hold diversity events that are inclusive of the community. Recognize days that recognize gender diverse people. Most places do something regarding Remembrance Day or at least, at least acknowledge it, right? Trans Day of Remember of uh, Remembrance is November the 20th. Pink Shirt Day is coming up, which is a great one, February the 28th. Hold an office-wide something or a social media campaign or something to recognize that you are aware and trying to actively participate. And consistency is key. This is a big one. If the safe space is only safe on Wednesdays during lunch and Friday afternoons, then it's not a safe space. It has to be safe all the time. Again, I'm going to jump this because I want to make sure I don't even, I have six slides left, okay? <laughs> I don't want to go over time and I want there to be time for questions. Legislation and policy. There are many pieces of legislation that support you in this work, okay? And I encourage you to find out if your workplace has a policy regarding it. And if you don't, try to have one made. Push for that. Ask why we don't. We need to be inclusive of these people. We need to have a policy to make sure that everybody feels safe at work and that that policy is upheld. Okay, I'm on the wrap up now. The other thing I'd like you to know and remember is that this goes beyond your office or your workplace. This is every day out in the grocery store, out in the street. Um, and I ask you that if you are a cisgendered and heterosexual person sitting here in this meeting today, that you recognize the privilege that you have. The same way we needed men to stand up in a position of power to say that women had rights, we need cisgendered people to stand up and say that sexual and gender diverse people have rights. Okay, challenge the binary and heteronormativity when you see it. Ask organizations about their forms. Why is your form not more inclusive? You know you could do this or this to change that. Challenge transphobia and homophobia when you hear it. 
Do not think of ally as a noun, but as a verb. This is an ever present state of action, not something that we do once and is bestowed upon us. I encourage you to stand up and use your words. I often tell a short story here. Um, I was in a grocery store and there was a woman in front of me and another gender diverse person in front of her in line. And um, the cashier made a transphobic comment to the person um, at the front. And I immediately became uncomfortable. I'm identifying that as a potentially unsafe person and I'm trying to decide how I can now get out of line, get out of the situation. And the woman in front of me addressed it. She looked at the cashier and she said, that was not okay, that was discriminatory, that was transphobic. You can't say those things, especially working in retail, you need to be inclusive. And she was a very strong personality, um, but in that moment she validated me and I no longer felt unsafe. And I was able to stand there and look that cashier in the eyes and um, have my groceries scanned <laughs> without feeling unsafe and uncomfortable. Last thing, I have book lists a mile long. If you would like more information or like to read, I have lists upon lists upon lists. Please get in contact with me and I can send you things. Um, I encourage you to do some reading on this. This is important. Um, I also have a children and youth list. Please recognize that this is um, the list for you as adults joining here today. Um, if you'd like the children and youth list, I have that as well. We have many resources around the city um, that deal with this and are able to support. Many of them are online right now because of COVID. So there again, I encourage that um, you reach out to them or ask if there's a specific resource you're looking for. And then I made it to the end. I made it to the questions. How far over time am I? Four minutes, not bad. Okay, now I feel bad about the Jamboard though. <laughs> no worries. I think that was just fantastic. <laughs> and phenomenal and like thank you thank you thank you um so much uh I believe there was just one question about um the slides after the presentation I understand that um there will be a link to I did send the presentation. do you have them I sent a pdf copy to Amber it's absolutely more you're more than welcome to have the presentation everyone um that's great <laughs> if you have it I did send a pdf I don't know if it was disseminated to the the people. Yeah, I think it, I think that it will be. But Amber, do you want to speak to that briefly? Yes, I was just going to say I haven't um, sent it out anywhere yet, but I definitely can. And this whole session is also recorded and will be on YouTube tomorrow as well. So just to share with your network, if they were unable to come, you can have access to this exact presentation as well as the PowerPoint. All right, so I, my name is Rhiannon Adams. Um, I am the moderator for the question and answer period. I, there were um, a couple of questions that came up uh, while you were speaking. And so I'm gonna go through those really quickly. I think um, they won't take too long. And then if you have questions, um, Rin's email is now in the chat box. So you can reach out to him uh, afterwards, if you don't, if we don't get to the question, or if you have questions that you're not sure about, um, or just feeling like you want to have more of a personal uh, question, um, then you can reach out to him after that. Uh, I know that from my experience, I'm going to do one really short thing, I think, but I use she and her after speaking with Rin and, and understanding why it's important. Um, and I had a call from someone, not a client yet, maybe in the future, but who at the end said how much uh, she appreciated it and told me and felt safe enough to say that she identified as queer and um, just how much it meant to her that, that I had done that. Um, and it's an easy thing to do. So if it's something that you're comfortable with and um, are able to do then, then I recommend it because I've, I've only had really positive feedback from it even though I was nervous about doing it when I started. So thank you. Um, question, the first question that came up in the chat was uh, Spanish. Has there been any movement in Spanish with respect to pronouns? Do you know? Uh, I do have a colleague um, who is um, a Spanish teacher, fluent and um, Spanish is the first language. Um, we've had a few discussions, but it has not been his experience that there has been a lot of movement in Spanish. Um, however, 
I absolutely believe that it's coming. Um, and uh, it's trickling down. French is kind of um, be, been the second frontier, I'll call it, um, because French is, is our um, second language or second official language. But I'm sure that the trickle down effect will happen with Spanish in Canada. There might be more movement in Spanish in the United States. Um, that's certainly something I can look up and maybe get back to you on. I don't know um, how I could get back to you, but it has not been my experience. I have not heard uh, about a lot of movement in Spanish, no. Okay. Um, there was a question about alternatives to ladies and gentlemen. We then had people chime in with folks, y'all, if you're being, you know, pretty casual, uh, honored guest, welcome everyone. I know someone in, in the Jamboard put up instead of guys, you try other words. So um, are there any other, other recommendations that you have aside from those options? Yeah, I mean, again, I have lists miles long. I encourage you to use a, a title for whatever your audience is. So for me, students is easy, right? Or math 10, if you're meeting with, you know, a board, colleagues, is easy representatives friends um and you know i have heard people say that it removes the personality or whatever there are so many personality type words that are great um for my students i use hooligans you know um those words are are not necessarily something we use very often so they're not something we think about but th sitting down and thinking of a few words that you can use in the groups that you are a part of i encourage you to do medical professionals nurses lawyers you know, you can, you know, call people by their title um, is kind of the easiest one, um, but definitely colleagues is easy. Friends are, are in the one that I use a lot. I know lots of people are opposed to folks because they, they say it makes them feel, you know, uh, old school, but um, yeah. And yeah. it's easily Googleable. If you Google that, gender neutral terminology for groups, you, you'll get graphics and lists and, and I encourage that. Too. All right. Yeah, there was there's been some good ones. Um, someone asked about the the poster for the safe space that you had up, but then I believe someone added a link. So I think that we have that covered. Um, so if there are other questions, please feel free. Okay, there is one. Um so Melanie is asking. So what she said is I hope that all elementary schools and are teaching about this. Do you know if that's happening throughout? Um, these are impressionable years and um, help to shape thoughts. Um, honestly, the answer to that question is it's school to school based. Um, so there is in um, my school experiences, I teach with eminent public schools. Um, this is happening in some classrooms, yes. We have more and more uh, gay straight alliances and queer straight alliances moving into elementary school to discuss gender. Um, and gender diversity and gender understandings. Um, this is more of a, um, I'll call it a point of controversy in some of our religious-based schools and Edmonton Catholic schools and some of the Catholic boards around the city. Um, I am involved with multiple teacher um, QSAs from multiple districts throughout the province and know that um, the people who are involved in this work are doing everything they can to bring it to students, especially young students, because you're right, um, elementary schools um, and young children need this information. Um, there's also two programs out of the University of Alberta that are bringing it to um, schools, including elementary schools, Isthmus and Firefly, work with um, elementary schools and, and junior high and high schools. So, in that regard, yes, I have personal friends and colleagues who address it with their elementary students, yes. Um, but I I would love to see it be um, part of the curriculum and therefore mandated um, so that it is delivered to all students because right now um, that would be school and teacher and principal base. Good question. Thank you. Um, so I'm scrolling back up through the chat. So there was a question about um, how we can be consistent if our identity is based on our feelings, which can change. And, and I not understand, I'm not sure that I understand all of the question, but maybe. Um, consistent in language? I think so, because that's what we were talking about. But um, Colette, if you have additional comments, I will scroll down. 
Um, so I'll begin to answer that. And if you have more to add, um, please jump back in, Rhiannon. Um, so I, I would ultimately say that identity does change. Identity is fluid, especially when we're talking about youth um, and children, because they're in the process of learning who they are. And um, I like to call it trying on hats. So we're trying things out, as we talked about in the presentation, trying out labels, seeing how that label feels um, and whether or not that feels good to have other people call you by that pronoun or that name. Um, and that exploratory period is extremely essential. And I think um, should not be displayed in any way. And we do have students um, and adults that transition and then transition back. And that's fine because there was a feeling there that one it needed and wanted to be pursued. And then we once having both experiences, know where we feel best and we'll probably move to that new space. And that is completely fine. In terms of language, it's just about informing the people that are around you um, that you trust and feel safe with. So, um, you know, change my pronouns to he, telling the people that I love and that love me and who support me back. And then having another conversation if that changes. You know, I, I've tried this out for a while, but I think I'd, I'd like to try they, them, or I'd like to go back to she, her, or whatever. And that's okay. And the people who love and support you will be with you through that because they're there to help support you find your identity. Was yeah. that, did that, I hope that answered the question. Yeah, I think it does. And, okay. I, you know, being, being kind to yourself and allowing yourself to experience and grow and not and not making yourself into a box right like not saying okay I, I don't fit here I must fit over here and then realizing that maybe that's not the right spot for you um, I'm just gonna see if there's there been are any... so many boxes <laughs> there's way more than two you can float all over them um, absolutely okay. so I didn't see another comment on that okay I do have oh my gosh there's so many things okay so and there's lots of thank yous. Um, with a blended family, how would you create a safe space for a child who has identified as bisexual, but does not feel supported in their other home? It's a tough uh, one. So this is a difficult situation. And, and I recognize that. And I'm glad that you recognize that. So um, ultimately, what this comes down to is conversation and education and um, the child and the child's safety and the child's um, right to their identity. Um, so if we have uh, one home that is supportive and is working toward understanding it or whatever, um, having conversations with the other um, home that's involved, explaining why this is happening and um, that the safety and mental health of that child needs to be supported. I am a person, I'm an educator, so I, this is, I would use some of the stats from the presentation, right? I use facts. So we know that a lack of support is dangerous for the mental health of that child. We also know that support is extremely beneficial for the mental health of that child and knowing that there has to be forgiveness. So if, if the other home is resistant, it's a great idea to try to find out why. So is this, I just don't have the language or I just don't know enough about this so I feel uncomfortable about it so I'm being resistant those are often um, where that lies my other big experience with parents is that parents that are resistant or that are upset about their child coming out as gender or sexually diverse has nothing to do with them being gender or sexually diverse it has to do with that parent being concerned and worried about their child having more hardships in life than they originally thought and that is coming from a place of love. And the only way that we can address that is by talking about it and is by supporting that child as best we can, finding safe spaces for them um, and uh, ensuring that they know that there are adults there in their life, even if um, there are struggles in one home. And um, the other thing I'll say on that is sometimes it just takes a little bit of time. This is something that has to be sat on and percolated and mulled over um, for people, especially if it was a surprise to them when that coming out happened. Um, and so I, I encourage, and Brianna used the word, be kind to yourself. Um, we need to be kind to each other and knowing that we're all learning and growing. Um, but of course, if we feel that that child is truly in danger, then we may need to take more aggressive steps. Um, but 
I hope that answered your question. Yeah, I think that was really, really, really good and gave really good suggestions. Um, the next question is, are there up-to-date resources on asexuality available? Uh, yes. Um, if you want like specific resources on asexuality, um, I can I can probably pull some of those and, and pass them along to be sent out. Um, but you know, in general, asexuality is its own spectrum and its own beautiful place to be and is not one designation, just like gender is not. Um, asexuality has many, many faces and many forms. If, I don't know if you want me to just talk about it as, as it is, or if you're looking for a specific type of resource or books or whatever, but I can certainly um, pass those types of things along. For anyone who doesn't know, um, asexual is the, um, like I said, it is a spectrum, but it is the identification that someone does not have sexual attraction um, or does not experience sexual attraction or perhaps does not want to engage in sexual experiences. Now that does not mean that that person will not or refuses. Like I said, asexuality is its own spectrum, um, but it is a, a beautiful thing. And I, like I said, I can certainly pass things along. I would encourage you um, to go to the um, ISNIS website. That's ISNIS. Um, they have a lot of resources up um, regarding all types. Um, I don't have a asexual specific one off the top of my head, but I will certainly find something and get get it to um, our lovely host here who can send it out. I hope I answered. Yeah, this is one of those. I don't know where they come from, so I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> if they got no, I, so okay. call it and followed up. Um, and please let us know. So I'm going to read what it what was written, um, what they said, uh, and um. And then we can make sure that we've covered it. So if this was the sort of the beginning one and, and about being consistent, um, or so it says, if our identity is based on our feelings, I fear it is inconsistent in and of itself. And how can we answer that? But I think that still goes back to the, that's okay. Like it's okay to be inconsistent. Um, it's it's yeah, like, you're not just a single person like you're a single person but you're not just like a blob of this is who you, you are not a statue and yeah. and things change and identity changes and and yeah exactly as Brianna said and that's okay and only through exploration can we find what feels best for us and so inconsistency is not a bad thing um my gender exploration my gender journey was extremely inconsistent. And even now where I'm landed in a place where I feel pretty good, I still have inconsistency because, you know, gender is <laughs> in a lot of ways, um, not something that is singular as we discuss, right? And is broken into many pieces and all of those pieces are always in play. And, and gender fluid people, um, you know, this question kind of relates to that. Gender fluid people, do have inconsistency that is their identity that is the designation they move between the colors and that's okay and that's great and that makes you in my opinion very unique and able to understand multiple sides of, of things and have multiple perspectives and that's awesome um so i there's another question here and it's actually one that i've sort of wrote down for myself i know um so i have young children uh, but this one says, as a new mom or a mom to young ones, uh, are there any tools or recommendations to raise your children without the pink blue mindset? And my, I guess that wasn't quite what my question, but um, similar. And can, can you, um, do you need to, uh, and I think, sorry, I'm just now adding to it. Um, can you say, yes, there's pink and blue, but there's also all of this, like, is there you know, what are, what are your, um, I guess, what do you know about this and tell us about your, your view? If, or, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. If, if this is a value that you hold as a parent, it will come through to your children. Um, I have a friend who is, um, one of the fiercest allies I've ever met and she has two young boys 
Um, and she openly just talks to them about it. And people always have this fear that young children won't understand or can't understand. They understand easier than most adults because they don't have the social construct of society already imposed upon them. So buy them whatever toy they want. When they wander down the blue aisle or the pink aisle for the first time and go, oh, I want this, say, okay. And know that one day they're going to come home and say, oh, Johnny across the street, my neighbor says, I'm not allowed to play with trucks because I'm a girl. Have that conversation with them. Say, okay, some people believe that. Some people think that that is the way it is. However, for me and in our house, that's not true. You get to play with whatever toys you want. And, you know, my, um, or wear whatever clothes you want is another big one. And my friend that I was talking about, she actively participates in pride events and takes her children with her. So back when we were allowed to all gather in mass and we had a pride parade, um, you know, she took her boys to the pride parade every year. And, and she would come to me and she would ask me that exact same question. She's like, how, how do I know that they know that it's okay no matter what they are? <laughs> By doing those types of things, you are impressing upon them your values and beliefs based on how you treat people, based on what you feel is important, and it will absolutely come through. And the first time they say, oh, you know, I, I had this person at school said that they had two mommies. Isn't that weird? You look at that child and say, no, that's not weird. That's absolutely awesome. That's love. And normalize it. And they will go, oh, okay. Can I tell a quick story about this? Actually, it was one of my, so. You didn't um, get to tell a bunch of stories. Go, go. I, I could tell stories all night and you probably don't want to hear me talk that long. Um, I was supporting a um, gender diverse youth who was identifying as non-binary. So not male and not female, but on the non-binary spectrum. And they had, two very young niece and nephews and it, they were very close to and they were very concerned about coming out to these children because they didn't think that um it would go over well or that they wouldn't understand um and so they asked me to come and help support so we sat these two young kids down and we talked about what non-binary means and um being both or being neither and that being okay and normal um and you know we're going to go by this name now and these pronouns. And then I said, if you have any questions, just ask. And they went away and they were playing together and they were formulating their questions. And then you could see them chittering. They were talking. And I'm like, well, we're going to get a question here. And they came back and that's what we got. They said, I have a question, young, young child. And I said, okay. And, and of course, the, the youth that I was supporting got all nervous. And they said, it, and they go really serious, the hands on their hips. If you're not a boy and you're not a girl either, what color is your bike? <laughs> and out of the whole thing, that was the most important question because girls' bikes are pink and boys' bikes are blue. So if you're neither, what color is your bike? Um, and I thought it was a perfect depiction of how easily young children take these ideas on when we normalize them yeah, and for absolutely. anybody who wants to know the answer is red their bike was red <laughs> <laughs> um there was a another question that come up um and then a potential answer here so are non-binary and queer the same and then and then the answer potentially queer is the overarching term and non-binary relates specifically to those who do not who don't have a gender identity Yes, question mark. That Very close. Yes. Okay. So gender queer is somebody who is gender diverse. Gender not is it's an umbrella term. Okay. Um, Non-binary is I'm not male and I'm not female. I'm not either of those two. Um, so they certainly are used interchangeably by some people, but the word queer by itself can mean sexually diverse. Right, so if we just say somebody is queer, that might be that they are a lesbian or that they are pansexual, but cisgendered, okay? Gender queer is referring specifically to the gender being diverse. Um, and then non-binary is just a tiny bit more specific saying that I'm not male and I'm not 
female. I hope that clears that up. I think I will need to continue to look at definitions for a little bit. <laughs> I will work on it. Um, they're, but yeah, they're both no, umbrella I, terms. Yeah, and it and it makes sense when you talk about it. I think that you know, sort of going back to me, like, oh wait, wait, wait um, will be helpful. Uh, there's so many thank yous. I think uh, Amber will be able to pull them out so you can read everything. Um, I'd love that. I because I feel like I'm missing. <laughs> I'm <no>. missing. <laughs> I can't. This is awesome. Thanks for arming us with such tools and knowledge to be more inclusive and informed, and really, um, and so many great takeaways and. Uh, just there's just been so many positive comments there. I don't know if there were any other questions, and we're pretty close to eight thirty. Um, so I think uh, I'll put a last call out for questions. Uh, I need a thesaurus. <laughs> oh, if that's a new one, new comment. Um, and uh, okay, and thank you. There's lots of thank you. So. It, Genuinely, thank you so, so much for doing this. Um, I know Crystal is doing the end part, but I, I want to say that. And, um, you know, when you came and spoke to the, the society the first time, um, I was a bit emotional about it and, and hearing some of your stories and even hearing them again. Um, glad my camera was off. Uh, one of the things I took away from, from one of your stories is, you know, how much, how hard it must be um, in a day-to-day -day situation. And um, if there's little things that I can do and they really are little, even though they are challenging at the beginning, honestly, using my pronouns now is such, um, it's a, I do it all the time, it's in, my, it's in my email. When I first started doing it, it was, <laughs> was scary for me. Um, I wasn't sure how it was gonna be taken, you know, uh, sending it to clients and stuff, but uh, you know, it's only been positive. So um, I, I really do appreciate uh, I appreciate you and and your willingness to speak. So I will stop now. And let me here. The official one. <laughs> okay. Can I can I can I leave oh. the people with a last thought? Yeah, of course. Sorry. Oh, no, that's all right. I I I appreciate you sharing that story. And on that note, I encourage you, everyone here. I implore you, please. I I ask you to do something. So take. It doesn't have to be the whole thing. It doesn't have to be big. It can be small. It can be as small as putting your pronouns in your email signature, but take a step, do one step. Um, and I implore you to do this uh, because the more of us that do it, the more inclusive and I appreciate all of you coming. And I ask you to do one more thing than just coming to this and, and take one step. That was amazing. Thank you so much, Rin. Um, on behalf of the Women's Society um, and myself, uh, that was so powerful and enlightening. I learned so much and I hope to continue to learn um, about this. I think it was beneficial for everyone who joined us. I'm so happy that we recorded it and we can share it with our colleagues as well. Um, and I also want to thank Blue Cross, who always sponsors these talks for us. Um, we couldn't do it without them. And we are happy to be hosting the What the Health Talks every month. Um, we're always open to new topics if anyone has anything that they would like us to cover. Um, so next month is actually Heart Month. So we have Dr. Colleen Norris joining us um, to talk about all things heart. And then we also have a psychologist, um, Mallory Becker, who I believe will be touching on relationships, which is also part of heart health. So thank you again, Rin. That was amazing. And thank you to everyone who joined us this evening. And we hope to see you guys next month. And now we will let the awkward goodbyes begin.